pleased to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Jim Stiff. Uh, Jim has served as a physics faculty member at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Then he moved to the Ohio State <laughs> as professor of physics, where he established physics education research group. And uh, not being challenged sufficiently by that, uh, he became vice president for physics resources at the American Institute of Physics, which translated into English means he was in charge of everything except uh, publishing journals. Yes. Uh, very important. Uh, set of responsibilities and had a major impact on AIP activities over many years. He has since then decided to spend more time on the golf course um, and traveling around the world doing uh, uh, physics education workshops in uh, practically every continent. Uh, and we're pleased to have him here this morning to talk about teaching issues dealing with diversity and retention. Jeff. Okay. First, I owe you an apology. Uh, I was in uh, New York over the weekend doing some reviewing for Sloan, so I got in a little after midnight last night. And I got up this morning, and I, everything is running on schedule. My wife has gone to church, and I plan to be here by about 8 o'clock. I reach for my car keys, and they are nowhere to be found. <laughs> and I uh, couldn't get a hold of her, couldn't get a hold of Bob. So uh, anyway, it's, it's been a long story. So, uh, but I've got a good heart. It's still working. Okay, uh, so um, again, what I want to do this morning is to just talk about uh, what I call uh, teaching for retention, uh, and there will be issues of diversity, where I will be talking about diversity from a uh, wide-ranging uh, point of view. Um, okay, and what I hope to do is by the end of the session, this is not where we are. Uh, this is an, uh, a, the cover of the Verse magazine uh, of the order of five, six years ago. I, I forget now. And, and basically what it's what it, what um, sort of pulling on is the fact that when we start talking about the name diversity comes up, uh, oftentimes the first thing we think about is racial diversity. But then after we start thinking about racial diversity, the bottom line is that most of us don't believe that we need that discussion about racial diversity. All of us bring our baggage to the table, and we'll talk about that for a bit. But basically, uh, um, people tend to think that the whole issue of diversity is what the other person is thinking about. And if only they will get on board, this would be a clear issue. And that depends upon, and that is, does not depend on whether we're talking about racial diversity, ethnic uh, diversity, which I use a little bit differently, gender diversity, or uh, diversity that has to do with the underrepresented or the challenge, physical challenge. So, to put this in the right frame of mind, I want you to think about two questions. First, what is your definition, this is for you, so what is my definition of diversity? And what do you see as the value of a diverse physics profession? So think about that for a moment. Okay. Now, I tend to like to have graphics. I'm a visual kind of person, which talk to me about diversity. And so this is the one that I tend to like. I'll come back later and tell you why I like that particular one. So what do I want to get out of this morning's uh, whatever time I have left? to get back on schedule. We want to reflect on 
the benefits and challenges of diversity in physics. All of us will do that. We like to have, we, we use some case studies, which I believe promote the discussion about diversity. Uh, I'm a firm believer that what we have to do is to get people talking to each other. We want to talk briefly about, uh, to identify the research bias for unconscious uh, bias, uh, research basis for unconscious bias and stereotype threat, and articulate the implications of, of those. We want to discuss some strategies using case studies to address the challenges and benefits of diversity. We're going to, you started reflecting on your personal definition, we're going to come back to that in a bit. But first, uh, those of us in the military always say that, um, you know, when, you, we, when you're giving a talk and, and you are anticipating a slide that's coming up when you're, when you're on a strand of thought, and then one pops up that, uh, that you was not quite in that lecture time, you start with but first. So this, is <laughs> <laughs> so this is my but first slide. But first, I believe that what we have to do is first get over the fact that we all bring things to the table. And each of us is a product of who we are, where we have been, and the experiences that we've had along the way. And each of those experiences will to some way dictate how you respond to the new experiences that come along. So I start up by talking about who am I? Because even though I'm standing up here, I also bring my own set of experiences and biases to the table. And since I'm going to ask you to sort of lay yours out to me and the rest of us, I think it's only fair that I started by talking about my set and what are the things that influence the way I think about things which have me out along the way. First, I'm a product of a single mom. I grew up in rural Virginia. And when I first became a professional, the fact that I grew up in rural Virginia had an awful lot to do, to do with the way that I responded. Because frankly, I just couldn't understand what made you city folks think. I just did not relate to many of the things which folks talked about. And, and uh, I had to get over that. Well, at least get used to it. I'm a product of HBCU. That means a historical black college or university. And the black college experience, I believe, is different from the traditional white college experience. Three of my daughters went to TWIs, as we now call them, traditional white colleges. And when I look at the experience they had as undergraduates, that experience did not mirror anything like the experience that I had. And when we go back to reunions, it shows up every single time I go back. I'm a retired Army officer. And the fact that I spent 25 years in the military colors the way I think about certain issues. And frankly, when I joined the faculty at Ohio State, and I got there and I said, what are these guys thinking about? What do you have to do to get a decision made around this place? <laughs> <laughs> and what do you have to do to get a decision that's final around this place? Because I go to a faculty meeting and we spend two hours talking about something. We take a vote. The vote will be announced. I would think, that, okay, that's it. Don't like it, but that's what we decided. I come back to the next faculty meeting, what's the first item of business? That thing we just voted on, what are we gonna do about it? Well, it took me a while to get used to that. I'm a college professor. And having worked basically my entire life around young folks and, and those who thought they were young but were still back in the 40s, since I was a 60s kid, I can talk about that. Um, I think differently about issues when they arise. I, I like to think that my difference, my, my difference is better, but that's, that's my personal bias. 
Uh, I'm the professional society executive. I spent, you know, some years of my life looking at balance sheets, trying to decide how things were going to get paid for, and which of those things that people wanted to get paid for, I really could afford to pay for. And just because something was good, I couldn't necessarily afford it. And that bothered me for, for a while. And then being a professional society executive who worked with folks in academia, there was a whole different set of thinking about the issue. And then finally, I'm now retired slash retreaded, best job I ever had. Also causes me to think differently about things. And I try, I work hard on this, folks. I try not to talk about the way it was in the good old days. So I I'll try not to do that. OK. And then there is the belief system that one brings to the table. And what do I believe? I believe that those educated in a diverse setting are more likely to be intellectually nimble and creative. That's my basic belief. Now, that's why I value diversity in the classroom, and that's why I value diversity uh, in, in society as a whole. I believe that those educated in a diverse setting are more likely to make meaningful contributions. That's my core belief. And I think they are more likely to be team players. I think those who are educated in a diverse setting are people who learn what they should have learned when they were in kindergarten. They play well in the sandbox together. And if we don't play well in the sandbox together, then we tend to have difficulty. And ultimately, I think, they are more likely to be, become successful leaders. Ah, but first, <laughs> <laughs> they're more likely to do the right thing. OK, again. Um, when I step into the classroom or step in front of a group of people, what kinds of things do I tend to think about? I worry about whether or not that joke that I picked for that particular audience that I was so great when I was planning this thing, did it offend anybody when I, when I told it or the way I told it? I worry that as I work in my class, are my biases coloring who I call upon to answer the question? Do my biases affect how long I'm willing to wait for Richard to give me the answer? Because he doesn't know it anyway. So why do I need to wait all this time for him to say nothing? But I know I've got to distribute my questions around. I know I've got to talk to many of the folks in the class. So I mean, I'll give them the due diligence on this day. Is that happening when I'm doing this? Is what I'm talking about relevant to the lives of the people to whom I'm having a conversation. Do I really believe that every student in this class can succeed? Because the research says that if you don't believe that, that student very quickly picks up on the fact that she doesn't believe me in me anyway, so why should I work? That does happen. Why are so few women taking my class? Is that the university's fault? Or is it my fault? Or since I'm a physicist, I know whose fault it is. It's all of those terrible high school teachers out there who are weeding all the physicists out. So therefore, it's their fault. And as long as I can make it somebody else's fault, I feel pretty good about myself at this day. <laughs> Are any of my students feeling excluded on um, this particular day? <laughs> you know, 
there's nothing like getting to the end of the derivation and there's a minus sign where you know there should be a plus sign. <laughs> <laughs> and you realize that in step three, you made the same sophomore mistake that you're always yelling at the students about. And am I paying attention to my students who have disabilities? I mean, really paying attention to them. Okay. Now, what I want to do now is, uh, Bob, keep me on track, please. Okay. What I want to do now is, talk, is to give, for the discussion that I plan to have, what I want to do is to talk a bit about some of the research data. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. And what I've tried to do is tell you what, what, the, uh, what the reference is. So, uh, so if I have stayed to my, my color coding, the uh, statement is in red, the research is in blue. <laughs> OK? Uh, turns out that the research state shows that parents' estimates of math ability are higher for their sons than it is for their daughters despite no gender difference in the test result. And, and then I say as a, uh, as, a, uh, uh, as, a, as a typical alpha male, I was not guilty of that. <laughs> I had no sons. <laughs> Blind randomized trials, when asked to rate the quality of verbal skills indicated by short text, Evaluators rated the skills as lower if they were told an African American wrote the text than if they were told a white person wrote it. Same piece, just who wrote it. And they gave lower ratings when told a man wrote it than when told a woman wrote it. Your CVs of real women were assigned a male or a female name randomly. And since the 238 academic psychologists to review either at the time of the job application or at the time of review for an early tenure decision. Respondents were more likely to hire the applicant if a male name were attached to the vita. The gender of the applicant had no effect on the respondent's uh, likelihood of granting tenure when the CV was presented. But those with the women, woman's name on it had more cautionary comments written in the margins. The interesting thing about this research is that in every study, there was significant difference on the, uh, a different effect on the gender or race of the person being evaluated. But no effect in terms of the gender or race of the person who was doing the evaluating. In other words, if there were women who were doing the evaluating. We saw the same bias in terms of women, male, as we saw with men. If there were African Americans doing the evaluating, we saw the same bias with respect to white versus after, uh, white, African Americans, what did I say? Okay. And so therefore, the question becomes, what do we do, I think? In blind randomized trial, evaluators rate the same job performance lower if told it was done by a woman. And the reason I included this one, because it's similar to the other one, <coughs> but the next statement. This difference was substantially greater when the evaluator was busy or distracted. And so, and then, and how many of you do evaluation when you're not busy? Uh, 
Okay. Now, what are the reactions when people tend to be presented with evidence of this bias? Not here. It's like that in Sweden, but not here in the United States. We don't do that. Okay. It's like that in rural universities, but not in urban universities. <laughs> okay. Who's not guilty of the last one? They're just too sensitive. If they weren't so sensitive, it wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> or we attack the data. <laughs> or we attack the data. OK. Now, several years ago, uh, this was published in 2012, based on the fact that we had, every time we would give this talk to scientific professionals, they would say, look, that is the population, that the population of universities is the population of urban America, is the population of rural America. Scientists don't think like that. Scientists are more objective. We rely upon the data. So we put together a, a position and sent it out to I think the number was 228. Don't quote me, don't hold me. It was of, of that order. And the population were biology and physics faculty. And that was the population. And the question that was asked was, if you receive this resume with this job description, do you think this person is competent to be hired. If the, well, first, do you think this person is competent? If you believe this person is competent, would you hire them? And then, if you hired this person, would you agree to be their mentor? Those were, the, those were three questions. The results, again, identical. Resumes. The black shows the competence of the male student, the male name. The gray shows the competence as rated by the 228 people of the female. You see the result with the error bars. It's significant. Now, if the person was competent, would you hire them? And so the second is the subset of those who were found competent, but would you hire? And again, the black shows the male, the um, gray shows the female. And finally, if you found, if you hired this person, would you agree to be their mentor. The black shows the male, the gray shows the female. And again, the entire subset were biologists and physicists. And so we are no longer can we say that that is just what happened out there in the other population. As scientists, we don't do that. And then I think this is finally. We said, of those people that you would hire, what would you give as a starting salary for this particular job? The black shows the written in starting salary for the male student, and the gray shows the written down starting salary for the woman student. And so what we say is that, okay, folks, now let's start having a conversation. 
because clearly in our community, this is still an issue. So, all of that is background. But first, I don't want to leave in the fact that all is, all is dark and gloom. Because the research does show that something can be done about it. And so if you are an administrator or a person who has um, authority on do, do things, what, sh what can be done? If you show images of great black figures, and then if you're looking at uh, our racial diversity, before they start doing the evaluating, there wasn't nearly as much bias in the outcome. Now, I'm just reporting the data. I'm not smart enough to tell you why that's the case. But the research does show that. Skeptics will express less prejudice against African Americans if they were instructed to avoid prejudice. I mean, simply telling people, look, I want a balanced outcome here. I want a fair evaluation. For some reason, that tends to help. And then the third one is one that I really, I really like. If people sim simply sit down and have a discussion about the evaluation criteria before starting, it significantly levels the playing field. And then lastly, if you give people enough time to do it, the outcome tends to be much better. So therefore, as administrators, and those of you who say, never me, but it'll happen, these are things that one can do. So I now want to get to your part. I've already talked longer than I had planned to. I want to have some discussion about this. And I want to use case studies to do so. Uh, because I have learned that case studies tend to provide a better framework for having a discussion about the particular kind of diversity we want to talk about. But before doing that, I need to figure out who's going to talk about what. I'm going to give you a case study. And I want you to spend time at your table talking about the case study with your colleagues. That's the people at your table. All right? And then once you've finished having that discussion, and I'll judge by uh, the noise level in the room when it's time to stop, then be prepared to share that information with your other colleagues. It, each case study has a specific question that you're asked to address. In addition to <coughs> the specific question you're asked to address, I want you to think about what do you think your institution might do to address that particular issue. Okay. Now, if you are an even table, I want you to work on the case study to intervene or not to intervene. And I think I named them on there. If you are an odd table, as an odd number, I want you to look at the case study, which is a different approach. Any questions about what the assignment is? Say again? Any questions? OK. Then that case, go to work. Is everybody ready to talk? Is everybody ready to share? Okay. Okay. So. Let me see. <laughs> Since that was up there, I go to the other group first, randomly. Let's first talk about a different approach. 
And those are my odd people, I mean, uh, odd number of people, correct? <laughs> okay, who wants to be the first to share? Let's go with um, table three. So initially, it seemed like there was a happy ending to, to, this, uh, to this situation, uh, that the professor, although initially irritated uh, with the alternative solution, eventually sort of acquiesced and said, thank you for your contributions. Uh, but then we recognized that there were various stages in here where each person uh, failed to sort of recognize the other's perspective. Um, I think uh, the professor uh, probably should have taken a step back uh, when an uh, alternative solution was initially proposed instead of being irritated, uh, said something like, you know, your, your uh, solution seems interesting, give me a minute to think about it. In the meantime, why don't we continue with the procedure that I've already sort of outlined? Um, at the same time, uh, the, the guy who jumped in and said, oh, Sally's right, you should do it her way, I think he wasn't necessarily recognizing the purpose for the exercise, uh, which could have been to actually show the method for solving a problem. It may not be the most efficient way to arrive at the solution, uh, but uh, that's not always the, the thing that we're trying to teach, not always the most efficient way. There are many different ways to approach a solution. Um, and I think, uh, I think Sally also uh, should recognize that in, in a, a lesson like this, that although uh, she may find a, a better, more efficient way of finding a solution, that uh, maybe that sort of comment in the, in the middle of the lesson is not as constructive as coming in afterwards, uh, after she'd already done it as the professor had said. Okay, all right. I'm out. Here I come. Uh, are you also uh, an I? I'm upset, but. Okay. You have said it all. Okay. Go ahead. I have no comment to make yet. Okay, so we, we execute Paul in the first of this. He might actually, because, uh, okay. It's, it's not, it's not, it's uh, probably it's not bias. We said when he, when he didn't uh, believe Sally, okay, maybe she's, because she's a ghost, but maybe she's a one person. But when he heard another student, okay, it's okay. So he looked. So we say we don't see bias here. So we excuse him from, from this. But then when he thank, when he thank Jean, said thank you Jean, and then Sally, then it's obvious here there is a bias because he thanks Jean first. So this is obvious that actually his his bias. Uh, what we should do, I think we, we, can, we have some disagreement. Well, some people said we, uh, Jean should say something. Like who? Everyone says Jean should say something. Yeah. I actually, I said no, Sally should say something. Sally should stand and she said, why you give Jean the credit? I am the one who did it. Do you have a comment? From, 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 from one of my uh, odd number groups? Yeah, uh, we thought that maybe uh, to give more credit to the girl, uh, he should have called her on the board and say, okay, why don't you show all us the procedure that you call it, uh, solve this problem differently, and that way you would give more, more credit. But yes, they would, we also recognize that there was a bias. In the moment, he acknowledged the boy first and the girl after. Uh, uh, I don't think that uh, anyone came out with a different uh, um, solution for uh, uh, Sally and John. Like, I don't know what they could have done differently, both of them. Okay. Because the girl, I mean, they are in the student positions, and so they're weaker position. So I don't know what they could have done differently. Okay. Anybody else have a comment to make? Here we go. Um, we didn't actually come up with a solution, but we did have um, kind of a vigorous discussion about okay. whether or not Sally should say something. It, sh it shouldn't be her responsibility, because if she doesn't say anything, maybe the professor doesn't even recognize that he has these tendencies. But if she does say something, he could just dismiss it. He could be completely aware that he does things like that and say, no, I mean, if he's a good guy, he'll be reflective and say, do I do that? How can I fix it? Anything you 
So we had this <coughs> similar sort of discussion, so there was definitely some disagreement. So um, my opinion, and I think at least some of us share this opinion, is that this is where the role of the bystander comes in, whether that's John or someone else in the class, that the others around do recognize that bias has just occurred. Whether it was um, conscious or not, need to step up, recognize the situation to help reinforce that this is not okay. Um, and so I think that the disagreement we had, I think, was mostly on whether or not Sally should use space. Sounds like it's very similar to what you did. But I think that it can be more useful and beneficial in the long run if it's those around who are recognizing what's going on step up and say, hey, you know, Sally's the one that did this. Make sure you give the credit to her. Yeah, but it's actually who should fight? Who should fight for you? Okay. John should fight for you or you should fight for yourself. Okay. Let me ask a question. How many people think that there is an issue of bias here. Okay. So what? And uh, okay. And those who don't think there's an issue of bias. And those who don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So um, if living in a democratic society here, looks like most people think there is a bias. What's the bias? Shout it out. Credit. Credit? Okay. Now let me ask let me let, let, let me ask one question. Suppose instead of Paul, that was Pauline. So Pauline Smith is the instructor. Would your reaction be the same? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, all right. I think more generally it, it, it may not be, if you reverse the names of the students, it may not be an issue of gender bias, but it might be an issue of bias, that the, the professor is more biased towards his own perspective rather than the perspective of particular students in the class. Okay, now let, let me paint a scenario here. You're teaching this class. This was an example problem that, you get, that you're giving, just trying to Recap what happened last uh, last week, because somebody told you it's good to review. Okay, but you've got three different, really important points that your gut says this class would be a total failure if you don't get to them. And this problem was put in really as an afterthought. And now here you are getting stuck on this blooming thing. So, do you dismiss it? Do you keep on talking about it? Or do you go back and realize that there's something going on here that you've got to, you've got to fix? Secondly, because I'm running out of time, who are the people that we are concerned about? Is it Sally, John, and Pauline? I mean, Paul, sorry. <laughs> or what about the other, let's see, this is a physics class. What about the other eight people in the class? <laughs> <laughs> what about the other eight guys in here? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Does this demonstrate something that needs to be addressed with them? Is this scenario setting the tone for what this department believes about the role that gender plays in this profession? It's an introductory course. So it may have, it may have 20 people in, sorry. So is this the question that's going to keep other young ladies from signing up for the course? Is this the question that is setting up the model for the instructional behavior of all the future faculty and whatever discipline that they will happen to be teaching in coming out of this course? What are the things that we have to worry about? And from an institutional point of view, and that's why I asked the question, 
from an institutional point of view, what do you think could or should be done as a result of this particular scenario? Now, from your institutional point of view, you're here to start having this discussion. My goal is to get you to start having this discussion when you get back to your campus with your colleagues, to start looking at what is the culture of my department? How does what we do on a daily basis influence what is really or, or determine or indicate what is really important for us in terms of the value system of this department, the value system of this institution, or my value system. Let me move on. So now we go back to, I don't give answers, folks. <coughs> to intervene or not to intervene? We now have my even people, and so, We'll go, let's go to four. Okay? Randomly selected. The situation. You, are you the spoken for your group? Sure. I'm just looking at you, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so for, for those of you who didn't read the scenario, basically. Uh, One thing that we talked about was that um, the professor could consider a Can you hear? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, in sort of saying, I, I, I'm sorry that you feel singled out, but you know, I was concerned about you, and sort of going back to um, saying, I want you to succeed, and so I, I saw this, and so I'm sorry if I'm offended you, but really I'm concerned. Um, and that's why I did what I did. Um, and then rather than sort of making a bunch of, of judgments and then coming to a resolution similar to what the other table said, giving the students several alternatives of things that they could choose from, rather than making a bunch of judgments and basically giving them their decision. Um, okay. Yes. Okay, this is not my table, but at my school we have a, have a support people. And if you're unsure if it's a class issue or like a personal issue, then it may be a good time to suggest somebody who's better trained to mm -hmm. talk to them too. Okay. And I saw a hand up this way. Oh yeah, that was basically our conclusion yeah. too. Oh, was okay. that it was time for someone, it was perhaps time for someone else to intervene in some uh, diversity office or, or uh, something like that. Okay. <clears throat> Being a diversity office is a good idea. Um, uh, but the situation here, I mean, the question is, are you going to do this for all your students, or are you going to pick out the ones that you think for some reason and, and you know, aren't, aren't going to succeed as well? And in this case, you're being sort of paternalistic specifically because the guy's a Native American. You think, well, maybe he's the first generation the rest of them. You're doing it with good intentions, but it's still extremely discriminatory. Um, and so in this case, I mean, the mistake has been made. And at that point, you know, you go talk to student services and, and see what you can do about it. Um, I mean, it's made with the best of intentions, but you said, okay, well, well, I'm gonna go pick on this student who's doing badly as opposed to my other students. I don't normally do this. You know, I, I wanted to do better, but I mean, this is not the way to do it. Okay. So we're running out of time, and, I, and again, I apologize. It's my fault. But this is a classic case of what can happen uh, if you don't, at first, first day of class, lay out the ground rules. What will I do when? What is going to be my response if these kinds of things happen? And almost every class somewhere along the way has a group of students who aren't doing well. And so the question is, what is my approach? What is my solution when I see one of you not doing well? Secondly, she made the mistake of what? Making a decision without getting the full set of circumstances. She did not know. She made an assumption. An assumption tends to get us in serious trouble 
almost every time, especially the bad ones. Okay. Every now and then we get one right. But most of the time, there's something wrong with it. And secondly, just as in the previous case, you know, Barbara had the best of intention. Barbara and Paul both had, I believe, the best of intention. Because most of us are good folks. We don't believe it, ask us. Okay. But it is always the unintended consequences that end up causing us to do an awful lot of work to fix the damage which had we simply given it some thought, had simply had our antenna up just a little bit more finely tuned, would not have gotten us in that situation in the first place. And then lastly, um, I don't, personal comment now, worry excessively about Jim because this is probably not the first time this has happened to him. And, and he has probably worked out a way of confronting this. As a matter of fact, he's probably using it right here. Okay. But I do worry about all the other people, and I do worry about the image that it portrays. Okay, what have we done? Uh, we have reflected on the benefits and challenges of diversity. <coughs> We've used a case study to start having some discussions. We've described, I have described, we haven't discussed, I described the research basis for unconscious bias and stereotype threat. We identified some various aspects of diversity and articulate some possible impacts of those. And we have begun at your table to develop strategies to address the challenges and benefits of diversity. We've started having a discussion. And you have reflected on a personal definition of diversity. So now I ask you very quickly, what one or two elements of your conception of diversity that you have, did not consider before this session started? Are there any? And I won't ask you to say what they are. This is just a question that I want you to think about. I said that was my favorite image. Why? The obvious is that it shows ethnic diversity. But it also shows that's probably a guy. <laughs> OK? OK? I'm guessing that's a female. I'm guessing. I'm guessing this is also one. So for me, without putting faces on here, it forces me to think about the various people that I'm talking about. And based upon the shading of the skin, I'm not quite sure whether they're African American or black or Indian or whatever. So for me, it sort of pulls, goes across the possible scenarios that we have. Today is my favorite day. It's Sunday morning. And most of all the nuggets that I have ever picked up and sort of keep going back to, I learn on Sunday morning while I, when I read the comic strip. I'm an avid comic strip reader. And this is one of my favorites that has come out. I almost picked out a different one this morning because uh, the, the one for the day is it has some really good stuff in it. <coughs> but I believe I'm beginning to mature because I have recognized that I don't quite have all the answers. I hope you resonate with that. And so I want to thank all my students who taught me to listen. I do do a better job now, I think. Uh, the diversity team at University of Wisconsin-Madison where I've had many of these discussions. Um, these are not some of their uh, um, case studies, but uh, we put together a whole stack of case studies for use in this. This website also has uh, instructions for how to walk to work 
through those case studies and discuss them and the kinds of questions you should be asking. And then, of course, my good friend Christine Stanley, who is now at Texas a and <coughs> when we were at Ohio State, uh, both of us were African Americans. We just kept getting tired of, of, of having our, quote, session on diversity where we were standing up there talking and could look at the eyeballs and recognize that nobody uh, realized or felt that, uh, one, that the things that we thought were so important were germane to anybody. And then Joe, from whom, I, from whom I have learned, you know, so much. Now she's an important person, so I'm glad to count her as a friend. And then Bob Lew at Harvard, who, uh, uh, from the SI Institute, um, uh, replaced me as the diversity guy. And then I love what he did to uh, the, uh, the presentation. Uh, and so the first time I listened to it, I mean, it was just a, uh, I said, why the hell didn't I think of that? <laughs> so that's where we are. And so I thank you very much. And again, I really apologize for um, not being a better caretaker of my car keys. And enjoy and have a good day. And I, I'll be hanging around for those who stay around. I think that's it. <laughs>